This week on Baseball Biz on Deck, we're going to be talking to two of the players from the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, Sue Zappay and Lois Youngin. They're going to tell the tales that have been also chronicled in the fiction of the League of Their Own. We're going to be speaking about the reality and what they're doing today to continue with that league. Sue Zappay is heading up a new League of Their Own tournament coming up here in Sarasota. It's the All-Americans Women's Baseball Tournament, and that's going to be November 17th through 19th. I'll put up more information on it later on, but just want to get you warmed up for that event. So let's get started. Welcome to Baseball Biz on Deck. I'm Mark Carpenter, your host, and with me today, I have two wonderful women who are going to share the story of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, what it meant to them, you know, their journey through that, and what's coming with the future as well. I have Miss Sue Zappay and Lois Youngin. So thank you both for being with us today. Oh, thank so you for having us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh, so much is going on. You know, the way my interest got started with all this is years ago, like a lot of folks, uh, first real introduction was watching a league of their own. and. I thought, is that, did that really happen? Was that for real? I was born in 1956. So at the end, I guess, of, of uh, everything going on with all of the, the league, but man, that was just so vibrant. And to find out as they got to the end of the film, they're showing, you know, some women and that, you know, you, you guys, I guess, but uh, not actually making a connection, but kind of alluding to that. These are the women who were in the film. Uh, the depicting, but those were actually fictional characters, but kind of based on, on what you all did. Is that, is that accurate? Yes, I think so. Okay. <laughs> well, good. Oh, well, my. Lois, you interrupt uh, me if you disagree. I, I, I'm going to tell the gentleman, Mark, that the movie was about 75% accurate. The other 25% is what I call Hollywood hyperbole. <laughs> And we needed that 25%. We're, we're not upset about the few little risque kinds of scenes. <laughs> Add a little flavor, draw a few more eyeballs into Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Oh, I love it. Oh, my gosh. Well, I can't imagine what that would be like. Uh, Lois, what, what year did you actually come into the league? I came into the league in 1951, and I played through 1954. Wow. I played for the Fort Wayne Daisies and the South Bend Blue Sox. Those are my only really two teams. You probably would like to know that my first manager in 1951 with the Fort Wayne Daisies was Max Carey, Baseball Hall of Famer. Right. In 1952, it was the slugger, the great double X, Jimmy Fox. Oh, my Mm -hmm. gosh. He only managed one summer, and I was fortunate enough to get to know him. So I might as well go ahead with my Jimmy Fox, all right? Please do. Well, in the movie, since we brought up the movie, if you had been uh, reviewing the film when it came out in 1992, you would have read that the Jimmy Dugan character, played by Tom Hanks, was a thinly veiled Jimmy Fox. Oh, wow. In other words, Jimmy Fox was a falling down drunk in the movie. (laughs) Obviously, having played for him, I can tell you, he was not a falling down drunk. He was, however, an alcoholic, and that was well known. Yeah. But if you remember your personal health 101, you will know that there are functioning alcoholics that do well day to day, and he fell into that category. So. He never missed a game. He never drank on the bus. He never missed the bus. He always tipped his hat. And he certainly never yelled, there's no crying in baseball. (laughs) In front of a large group of fans. Uh, We adored him, actually. I can't think of anyone that played for him in 1952 that didn't think he was just about one of the nicest men they had ever met. Wow. Well, well, Lois, how did... How did you get started? I mean, I, you had to have a personal interest in the game long before you made it to the league. How did that uh, connection start? 
Well, my dad was a uh, pretty fair baseball player himself, played in college and pitched. But uh, he really didn't spend a lot of time playing ball with me. Everybody thinks he did, but he didn't. What happened was we lived in a small rural town and the houses were on one side of the street and there was pasture field on the other side and there were only boys in the neighborhood. So there's no television, remember? Oh, yeah. this, is, this is the 1940s. And uh, my mother said, you can't read all the time and kick me out of the house. And all of a sudden I found out I had athletic ability that I didn't know I had. So the boys said, well, since I was the only girl, uh, we'll let you play, but you have to either choose between right field or catching. Being smarter than the boys, I said, I'll catch. So <laughs> that's how I became a catcher. And that's how I honed my skills, I guess, playing with the boys. I got to tell you, Lois, I respect catchers more than anything else. I mean, Today, I had the opportunity to speak in front of a Boys and Girls Club out in Tampa. And I always ask the kids there, you know, well, those are playing, what are, what role do you play? What position? And the young man says, catcher. And I, I applaud them right off. I start right there. I said, my gosh. I said, as that, in that role, you see the whole game, you know, right. you're, you're, you're talking to the pitcher. You're saying, hey, this is the next, this is the pitch we need. You, you become basically the captain of the team to do that. So, was that interesting, both as a, a young woman being the, the unofficial captain, if you will, as a catcher, or is that realistic of me to say that? Well, maybe I thought, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I told you should have a good story for you, Mark. Oh, no, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. No, but to, to, again, like I said, the catchers, though, you know, in, in life, you see a lot of them become managers as well. But let's talk about the manager position with with you young ladies at that time. I, there had to be protocols. There had to be things they could and couldn't do. I know they show the Hanks character falling down drunk or coming into the the uh, locker room, et cetera. Yes, with no one would ever have done that in the 1940s, not even Tom Hanks in person. So <laughs> <laughs> it just wouldn't have happened. <laughs> that, that's part of the Hollywood hyperbole, I guess. That's part of the Hollywood hyperbole. Yep, you're right. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So well, how did you still connect with, with the, the league itself? How did the introduction go? Well, for me, it's different for each gal. I think there were many tryouts in the beginning. See, I played at the end of the league. The league started in 43, started with four teams. It grew to eight teams in 1947 and 48, and then it dropped down again. I played the last four years, 1951 through 54, and uh, we had six teams in 51, and then in the next three years, we only had Five, and I guess I should call myself Lois the Terminator. Because, oh, oh well, that's the end. That was the end of the league then in 1954. But we had 12 very good years. And in 1947 and 48, almost a million people saw those eight teams play. Now, oh keep in mind, we played every night, seven days a week with double hitters on Sunday. Um, my phone's ringing. I'm sorry. I'm going to whip over here and shut it off. That's fine and dandy. Oh, Lois has a PhD. Yeah, I think that's what you call it. From yep. uh, I'm here. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> I, would just, I would just tell them about your doctorate or whatever you have, you know, bells and whistles education. Well, anyway, I, I had us having a million people see the uh, eight teams play, and Jeez. that's because we played over 100 games. It, it it varied from 100 to 110 or so. I just wanted to jump in here. It's a far cry from what MLB now does with their oh. pitch. You know, they have uh, X number of pitches and they have to take them out. You know, some of our girls pitched a game and then they pitched the next day. They pitched a game again, a full game. And, of course, we were doing nine innings at that time. Now the girls are doing the seven inning games. Well, I'm curious, Sue. I mean, what you were a pitcher yourself, weren't you? Not much. I, he only put me in there when he was desperate. <laughs> And I, I basically played second base and I played right field. And I didn't play a whole lot first year. I was two, only two years, uh, 52 and 53. Wow. And uh, second year, I was beginning to feel like one of the gang, really. Although 
even as a rookie going into the league, um, the players that had been there for many years were so receptive and, and so kind to the young girls coming in. It was like a family, it really was. Well, that's important. I mean, we talk a lot, you know, when I'm like even today with the youngsters at the Boys and Girls Club, we're talking about team, we're talking about community, we're talking about spirit, you know, and having that energy that you share together. And to me, that's that's a big part of when I what I see that you all have been doing, not just from historically, but also what's happening now. And we'll talk about that in a moment about in Sarasota and, and your also meetings. I did want to ask in regards to fans, what were the fans like to you all in the stands? How, how were you all treated by your fans? Wonderfully. We had a fan base that would rival any of the major leaguers, only on a smaller scale. And we had a Daisy fan club. I don't remember one in South Bend, but we had a Daisy fan club. And I'm not quite sure all the things that they did for us, but they did have a picnic for us once a year. And um, I can't tell you what else, to be honest with you. I can remember the gen older gentleman that was the president. He wrote to us during the off season and any news about baseball related to our team. Uh, he'd send it on to us between what would be uh, October and the following May, you, let's say. So I, I'm not sure what other functions he had, but um, I uh, he was I, I can see him now. He was a very, very nice gentleman. Well, yeah. let, let me ask you, you all both. Did I understand is, is it was it 100 games a year? Is that what you're saying? Yes, every and, night, seven days a week with geez. double headed on Sundays. Occasionally we have a day off, not very often. I know at the end of July, I was wishing that I knew more about Oregon rain and a w little of it would fly over and drop a little <laughs> rain on us. So, <laughs> we had a day off or two, but uh, seven days a week, double headers on Sunday. Wow. The double hitters were only seven innings each. Otherwise, it was a full nine innings. And then, and then, Mark, in addition, the ride home on the bus all night and then getting up the next morning for practice for the Good next Lord. day. <laughs> yeah, you know, I could see that whether either lay you out or you'd have to become a great athlete. I don't think there'd be we much were, room for anything in between. We were young and we were healthy and we loved the game. Right, Lois? Absolutely. Just loved it. A number of players would tell you that they would have paid their organization to play rather than getting paid. I didn't say that, but <laughs> <laughs> people have, uh, yeah, a catcher had a pretty tough time behind the plate. Uh, there are some things you need to know about us. Please. Uh, we played in that revolutionary one piece dress that you saw in the movie. <laughs> mm. <laughs> All right. And uh, unfortunately, Mrs. Wrigley designed it and she was enamored by Sonia Henney, the wonderful skater. <laughs> so she made it with a skirt so full that every time you bent over to field the ground ball, all you got was skirt. Oh, so, this was with the original girls in 43. And they said they immediately had to get big safety pins and pin in all that material. And then by the time Sue and I got to the league, over the years, we had shortened that dress and shortened it and shortened it and shortened it. So when I played and Sue played, they we played in a mini skirt. So <laughs> in other words, we had tights underneath, but we had full movement of both legs. <laughs> but it was still a one-piece dress. And I often wondered why Mrs. Wrigley wasn't smart enough to make it at least two pieces. So when you raised your arm, your whole uniform didn't come up. Yes. But obviously, she was not a baseball player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you always wonder when somebody creates something and, and they don't have to use it, you know, how they do. And, uh, I mean, the we one thing. We played in that all 12 years. Good Lord, woman. Revol I mean revol it was a revolutionary uniform, and it lasted. It was a thread that went through all 12 years of wow. the league. Wow, wow, wow. I, I keep wondering, though, I see some of those cases where you see somebody sliding in the base. I'm like, no, no. no. I mean, the strawberries that you guys must have got, the, the cuts, scrapes, and bruises must have been unbelievable. Well, Sue will tell you, if we got a strawberry early in June, you had it at Thanksgiving. 
Oh. Because you had to keep sliding on. We always slid feet first. I don't know if you remember in the movie, Madonna slides head first on her material girl's bosom. I wonder, <laughs> they, I wonder if they paid her extra, Sue. What do you think? I don't. <laughs> uh, but we never slid head first, other than the fact that if you got caught off of first base, you slid back head first. But um, we did what the men were doing in the major leagues, and they weren't. P. Rose hadn't been born yet, I don't think. But anyway, uh, we were sliding feet first and not head first into second, third, and home. Now, let me ask you another question, too. You played for a couple of di different teams. Were you assigned to those teams? Did you choose those teams? How, how did that work out? Well, I got I, I tried out for the Fort Wayne Daisies. And uh, they uh, one summer between my junior and senior year in high school, I was 16. In January of that year, they sent me a letter saying that um, if I'm still interested, they'd like me to come to spring training along with 30 other, I'd be trying out with 30 other girls. About uh, maybe two or three weeks later, I got a check for $20 to get me to spring training. Mm. So I went to spring training. I uh, the hardest part was getting out of high school because in those days you didn't get out unless somebody died. So I got out of spring. I got out of school, went to spring training. I think it was about four weeks long. I'm not quite sure on the length. Anyway, I came back. This is my senior year in high school. I went to my senior prom. I went through graduation and I became a Fort Wayne Daisy all in one week. Oh, wow. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> well, that's a heck of a story. I mean, my gosh. I mean, it's, it's such a change. I was wondering how the scouts did. I mean, we went out to find great talent, but there well, wasn't. They did at the beginning. I yeah. guess in the beginning. By the time I got there, I actually, uh, I don't think they were doing any scouting, but they certainly allowed players to come in and try out. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time visiting a relative in Fort Wayne, they said, do you want to go see the daisies play? And I said, <laughs> well, well, what do you think? You know, <laughs> oh, yes, yes. And in the seventh inning stretch, I turned to my cousin and I said, I can do this. this is 16 year old now. I can do that. And uh, the next morning I had this tryout, which led to the letter, which led to the check for $20. So but I tried out, and I think many of the gals tried out. But in the beginning, they had scouts floating around. Wow. Well, that's exciting. I mean, to think if you're passionate about something, I think people, you know, they, they'll go for it. And, and yourself, in that particular instance, it was obvious that you were taken by what they were doing on the field, be, wanting to be a part of it. But it it takes, like I said, I, the physicality and the athleticism to do that. I respect that. But I just cannot imagine with you all doing seven days a week, good Lord, and 100 yeah. games a year with with and with double headers, you said, on Sunday? Double headers on Sunday. Sunday. Uh, Every Sunday. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. Are you talking about the fans there? I was going to say that so many of them were the farmer boys because there were so many farms around there, and, and they would come out. That was their recreation on the weekends in particular. And uh, those were the ones we dated, and then <laughs> a few of them. And then, um, yeah, they'd, they'd have cookouts for us. You know, I can remember the steaks and the co sweet corn and everything all fixed for us when we would co come home from our road trip. That was that was our treat. You know, we'd have a big cookout. And, yeah, the fans were very good to us. Very good wow. to us. I mean, but it goes well, like remember, beyond... there was much else to do in those days. There's no television. Right. All right. Major League Baseball is so far away. The gas was rationed still. You know, you couldn't drive to a Major League game. Um, so they stayed local and they treated us very well, just like Sue said. I mean, there was something I heard as far as like spring training. Did did you all have spring training? We did. Yeah. Um, it wasn't, I don't remember how long it was. I, I'm not as good at just remembering stuff as Lois. <laughs> yeah. But I remember when I arrived there, I, I thought I was a pretty hot shot player back home. But when I got there and saw the level of uh, the ability, I, I said, oh, wow, I'm just a small a little fish in a big pond here. 
and realized that, you know, I was going to have to work to stay there. But the, 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 a coach said to me when I was very nervous about being there, said, you wouldn't be here if you weren't as good as the rest of us, Sue. So just stop worrying about it. Good deal. Wow. Sue. you know, it's to me, I, I, the whole idea of being on the road and the bus and all of these other women that you get to the camaraderie you're able to build uh, and Lois, like both of y'all were saying, as far as coming home to fans after being on the road and having a big cookout, my gosh, that, that had to be exciting, but it's still probably a lot of folks, especially since y'all were young, missing family at home. Oh, God. Oh, oh now God. wait a minute. <laughs> Sue and I had a chaperone. Do every, tell. every team had a chaperone, and that's another thread that went through all 12 years. Every but, team had a but woman. Homesick, but homesick was something that I was initially. I wrote home every night. I've never been away from home, from my home in Massachusetts. And it was tough. And by the way, the chaperone was the one who, who I tried out with in my in my state of Massachusetts. She was about 30 miles away. And I went drove to her house because my uh, my high school softball coach said, did you know there was a pro league in the West? And I said, what? And I was visualizing millions of dollars and fame and fortune. And I went up and had a tryout with this Dottie Green, her name was, who had yes. he originally had played in the league and, and tore her knee apart practically and decided to stay on as a chaperone. So she was with the Rockford Peaches for many, many years. And uh, and so she uh, apparently liked what she saw when I went up to throw a few balls. And two weeks later, I got a contract in the mail. Uh, it just, psh, that was it. Wow. So. As I was wondering, one of the questions I was about the chaperones, you want to say a little more about that, Lois? I want to hear that as well. Oh, I was just going to say it's a thread that went through all 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I think probably many of the gals would not have been able to play due to their parents' objection, possibly because we had a chaperone, it became a possibility and then a reality for many players. Wow. And and the chaperone was the one that took care of the strawberries. The chaperone was the one that found the host for you to stay in. We, all, we stayed in private homes. And by the way, when we came home, they did our laundry. And there was, it was always a nice homemade cheesecake waiting for us when we oh. arrived home. Not in Fort Wayne. Well, <laughs> Obviously, I was with the wrong team. I, that's right. You were. I always, I've been telling you that for how many years now? <laughs> <laughs> Lois and I have a little thing going between the Blue Sox and the uh, and Rockford Peaches. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that cheesecake sounds good. Oh, uh, Lois, I got a question to ask you. Being here from Tampa and near Ebor, you know, one thing we celebrate down at the Tampa Baseball Museum is Shoe Shoe Worth. Yes. And she was with the South Bend Blue Sox. Was that yes. she Before there when you were there? No, she was before I arrived, but I did know her name and I did hear her name. I didn't know she was from Florida at the time. I can't tell you too much about her. I thought at one time that she she was married. I'm not sure, maybe not, to a serviceman. I know she was a very little girl, you know, petite, dark hair. I've seen pictures of her in in a team on a you know, team pictures of the South Bend team. I think she played shortstop or second base. She was an infielder. And yeah, I, I, I remember seeing shortstop. More about her. Yeah, no, that's fine. I was just curious because I knew she'd been with the South Bend Blue Sox. I couldn't remember which year she was with them. But it goes to thinking also the, the breadth and width of where everybody came from. I mean, Sue, you're from Massachusetts, and you've got somebody all the way down here from Florida as well. Uh, and yourself, Lois, you're from Ohio. So yes, we had Canadians, a lot of Canadians, and we had some Cubans. How about that? <laughs> now, tell me if I'm wrong, but I understand on the, like if Cuba, not only did you have uh, teams that were interracial, but you had men and women playing together on those teams as well. So it wasn't just, you know, one way or another, it wasn't women just playing baseball by themselves in Cuba, they were also playing with the men. I don't know. I don't know nothing about that, but what if you that? look at the history of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League and say that fast 20 times, Wrigley <laughs> was stupid. <laughs> anyway, uh, 
1948 for spring training, either 47 or 48, the league, every player, every team was took the train to Florida, and then they were flown over to Cuba. Oh, my gosh. For spring training. All of them. And they had spring training there. Wow. At the, at the same time, at least it's it's probably grown into a myth. But anyway, the Dodgers were there at the same time. Well, the Cubans evidently had never seen blonde women baseball players because I guess the 20,000 people that normally would have seen the Dodgers play all decided the women were much more interesting. <laughs> so the Dodgers got left in the dust. Them bums got to, had to fend for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I talked to a couple of the gals that they're not with us anymore, but they said, uh, if you weren't careful, you got pinched four or five times every day. <laughs> so uh, the Cubans were pretty, I guess, uh, aggressive to say the least. And I know the gal that pitched the perfect game, Jean Fout, does not like fish. And she was there and she said she lost, I don't know how many pounds because all they had to eat was fish or oh. that was the majority of the meat that they had. So, but they were very popular and that's the connection then to get some of the women, the young women from Cuba back to play in our league. And there were four or five or six of them over the, from 48 to 54. I played with one, Isabel Alvarez. She was a left-handed pitcher. Yeah, at all pitches. I think I played with Mickey Perez, who yes. was, whose dad had a tire that he hung up in a tree in the backyard, and he used to make her throw through the through the tire just to yeah. right. So she never could throw hard, but she she could have control like you wouldn't believe. Little bit of thing. And somebody told me that she got killed in the Bay of Pigs, but then I found out later that wasn't true. Because uh, Lois, I don't know if you know this, it's only like three or four years ago, she was over in Miami and, and she died over there. And I never knew that. I All I know, the, the, another pitcher we had um, lived in Florida, by, got married and, and lived in uh, the Miami area. Mm -hmm. um, but we only had her address and a phone number and so on. So she never came to a reunion. We never got to, you know, reacquainted, so to speak, with her. Okay, well, one question I, I want to ask you. You mentioned a bat girl that was living in Florida, and I found out she lived up at the villages. I was telling Mark this, but I cannot remember what her name was. She was the daughter of one of the coaches or something. Can oh, you... uh, Jimmy Fox's daughter was yeah. a bat girl for the Fort Wayne team that summer that she, that he he was our manager. And but... I understand she lives up at the villages, Mark. Oh, That's wow. You got to reach out to those folks. I know, I know there's some other retired Major League Baseball players there too. I think that's where a lot of them go. Wow. I want to remind everybody, you listen to Baseball Biz on Deck, and we're talking with Lois Youngin and Sue Zappé from the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, getting a little bit of the history of what's going on with the game and insight that I never had before. So uh, I want to thank you, ladies. Well, what, I certainly have a few more questions for you, but I want to let, remind people, you know, all that you brought to sports. and. That's something to – one more thing I want to make sure with Lois we talk about is being part of that battery, being that catcher and pitcher. And Gene Fout was the person that – one of the pitchers you, you had. What was the communication with you guys like? How was that either calling the signs? Did you have a, a just a good synergy or was it something you had to really work at? Well, uh, uh, Gene was, as far as I'm concerned – the goat <laughs> um, <laughs> the overhand pitchers in our league and from the mid 1940s on she pitched her perfect game in the end of the 1943 season at Kalamazoo and it was I think September 3rd and we won that game four to zero I had been traded to South Bend in 1953. Yes, I said traded. So that, <laughs> what happened? And so I had had the opportunity to catch her more than once. And so when we got to the end of the season and we got to Kalamazoo, I had a pretty good idea of what, what she could throw and where she could throw it and uh, at what speeds. So, you know, in those days, things are pretty simple. One was a fastball, two was a curve, three was a change, 
and a fist was a pitch out. How about that? <laughs> so she could put her, first of all, I would like to have known how fast she really was because we had no way of knowing. There were right. no guns, you know, speed guns or whatever. Um, I did ask her once when she was retired and we were at a reunion, how fast she thought, she, you know, how fast are, did you, do you think you were in your heyday? And she said she didn't know, but she thought between 85 and 90, but she wasn't sure if she could hit 90. Now, remember, until 1954, our pitching distance was 57, between 56 and 57. It wasn't 60. We were three three feet short. Um, and we were using a 10-inch baseball, not a 9-inch. But it was being thrown overhand, which means you could make it do what you wanted it to do if you were good at doing that kind of right. thing. So, um I'd say she had the she was the fastest in our league. And secondly, she could put the ball anywhere, her fastball anywhere she wanted it. So she had really good control most of the time. And she could throw a curveball depending on the night. You know, we're not always great every time out. It would uh how did somebody explain it? Dropped off like a country road. <laughs> so uh and obviously, we used the change up, probably not as much as we should have, but her fastball was so good. Uh, she could put it where she wanted, as I said, and then every third or fourth pitch, we could throw in a curveball, depending on how good it was that particular evening. Obviously, it was good when we pitched, when she pitched her perfect game. So she had eight putouts that day, eight strikeouts. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hey, Sue, I want to ask you to, when you were playing, what, what is, when you were playing, who was the best pitcher on, excuse me, let me rephrase it, batting action. Who's the best batter you saw in the league? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I, I used to think it was the Weavers, right? Right, yep. Lois? Joe Weaver, probably. They could hit it over the over country fence. They were so <laughs> big and strong. They were, yeah. So was it two it, sisters? Yes. There, Jean and, and uh, Joe, Joanne called Joe Weaver and Jean, and then her other sister was Betty Foss. There were ah. three of them, and they were, they were all. Well, the t two of the sisters were over six feet, so they had nice long levers, which <laughs> means that. <laughs> What's happening at the end when you make contact is a little faster than some of we short folks like Sue and I. I'm five <laughs> three. I was, I think I'm five and five one now, I think, but I, <laughs> I was all of five three, maybe a little more than that. I don't know. But Sue's about my size and we're we're pretty much weighed the same, I think. What, hundred and fifteen maybe when we were playing? That's about well, I was about hundred and twenty, yeah. Yeah, give, give her, I'll take 120. That's okay. I had a lot of muscle then. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you're you're enjoying this league. You have all these great people around. You got the community, but then one day the word comes down. There's not going to be a league anymore. How how was that delivered, and how how did people deal with it? Oh God, you really want to know? <clears throat> I don't. I don't remember how. It was if well. You, we had we heard rumors all year in 1954. We uh, I had anyway. I was back with Fort Wayne then. I don't know how I got back to Fort Wayne to be honest with you. But in 54, I started with Fort Wayne, and my manager said, "I'm going to make an outfielder out of you because you're this, this, and this, and we have a catcher." So I played left field a lot. Uh, 1954. I don't know how I got back to Fort Wayne, uh, but I did. And there were rumors that people, you know, whisper campaign, I guess, I don't know, that uh, there wouldn't be possibly a league the following year. But I don't know how. I don't think they ever told us face to face. I think it's something that just sort of happened and it hit the newspapers probably. Uh, I, we had, I, I got notified at home. After we went home, and I had no inkling that that was going to happen because, being a rookie, I didn't hear some of the, the local gossip in Rockford as to what was happening. But uh, it was really sad because, as I said, two years 
my first year was a learning experience, getting my feet wet. Um, and my second year, I started to feel good. And, you know, I could hit the ball a country mile. But when I get up to bat, I was so damn nervous. I, I <laughs> could, It was you, you, because you, women never had that experience. Yeah. We never had fans like the boys will have the football fans there and they, they get used to it. And uh, I, I just uh, it took me a while. But anyhow, it was very sad. I think every one of us has said the same thing. It was one of the saddest days of our lives because at that age and playing the baseball, the game we loved, and then to have them say, it's no more. And, and it was like, what do I do? So, of course, most of, us got, most of us just got married. And I married the groundskeeper, the groundskeeper from Rockford Bayer Stadium. Oh, we, had been, we had been dating for a year and he didn't want to lose me. And, yeah, you know, he went to Pensacola for pre-flight and, went, and then went in the service. And as soon as he got his wings, we got married and then started a family. So that was that's, it. That's sweet. But it's, I've, I've heard so many stories, though, above, above and beyond being the athletes that you were, that, you know, many of you have gone out here, whether somebody would be a professional tennis player or a bowler. Yeah. Or, yes, that happened. A lot of people, a lot of the gals went on. A lot okay. of them went on to play other sports, maybe not professionally, but they certainly got involved. Jean Fout, for example, was a, a, a bowler. bowler, became a very, very outstanding bowler. You do know that my second sport was tennis, Mark. I don't know if you know this. And I was playing in 40 and over at that age that I was playing. I was 50, but I was playing 40 and over. And I got ranked up in New England in doubles and then moved to Florida and bought a small tennis club down here, which I still own. I can see it looking out my window. I live right next door to it. My son runs it now. But I got up to a pretty high level with tennis, was playing tournaments down here. Until they made the move, a league of their own movie in which I was told to hit a, a line drive over second and run to second by Penny Marshall. And I did that for one whole day over and over. And I hadn't played baseball for 40 years. I'd been playing tennis. And that hap happened to uh, wreck my left knee when I came back. I had an operation. And then that was the end of my tennis career. Dang, dang. You know, playing league, league of their own on that one. Yeah. Wow. My gosh. But, you know, the thing of it was looking at, at all of this came to conclusion that there's really wasn't an evolution of, of seeing public teams playing women's baseball. You know, the, the next thing I saw as far as women's baseball was long before that movie came out to leave their own was bad news bears. And, Oh, this is just, you know, monumental. This, this, this has never happened before. Is it Jodie Foster or somebody, you know, and yeah. she's on there with Malta math. Oh, we've, we've got a girl on the team, but <laughs> As you're talking, I mean, the women have been playing baseball everywhere else. Canada, they've been playing it for a long time. Cuba, they said you know, they were playing it. And Japan it was, is number one right now. There, there you go. And yeah. it's so now I know I'm looking right now, Sue. So you're you're making taking special efforts and to make sure that is reinvigorated here in the United States. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, that's funny. Uh, we had a meeting the other day and I, I got in touch with a gal who's been in baseball for a long time. She had a brain concussion and she spent many years trying to overcome it. Don't know if you know Tina Nichols, her name is. And uh, she, it was interesting. She brought a little flag, homemade flag that she made. And it had listed, oh, I would say maybe 10 of the top women's baseball teams in the world. And uh, and here at the top is uh, Japan. And then I can't remember the other two. And, and USA is number four. And I said, you know, we should we should make this into a banner from my tournament in uh, November and just put a little arrow there saying, OK, this is where we want to be up at the top. Number one, where Japan is. Well, Japan, you know, they're funded by the government. They play all year round. They have a professional league. So the women are playing and practicing. Our women play when they can. On a weekend, they get together once in a while. They're going to come down here and play in this tournament. And most of them hardly ever play with each other. They know each other. I mean, it's it, you can call it a ragtag tag group of women ball players, but they're all so good. You know, they just mesh right in there. So it, it works. So that's my thing is, I, I think I've mentioned before that I one of the things that got me going, one of our former players who since passed away at a players meeting had said to me, about our board of directors. They don't do anything, Sue. And, and I was on the board way back, back when it was uh, first put together in the 80s. I forget when you, I don't remember dates like Lois does, but 
And, and I thought to myself, all these years I've been into tennis and, and then I jumped back into the sea and the, the all Americans because I couldn't play tennis anymore. And I said, she's right. I, you know, I don't know what happened, but from all these years, from 1954 to 2023, there's no baseball. That's absurd. We were the first team of professional women in the country. Okay, then the movie came out and we sparked all the women to become athletes, and they have. And they all have pro leagues, and we have nothing. So why is that? Because nobody ever took the time to get out and do what needed to be done, which I'm doing, you know, to show the public these women can play, to present a pro program, and on and on it goes. I could spend a lot of time here going into this, but. Well, the, you know. the good news is, it's, you know, you're putting the spark plug back into this. I mean, the whole thing that you've got going with this tournament coming up in Sarasota and I want everybody, uh, the listeners, mark this down. I'll put it at the end of the notes, too. It's coming up in November. Let's see, the 17th, 18th, and 19th. Right, yes. By the way, there was a, a, a big, nice article in the Sarasota Herald Tribune today by Doug Fernandez. Um, it was nice. He sent me the link, and I kind of sent it out to everybody I could think of. And and that's the thing. We, get, we need to get the word out because last year we had an excellent – tournament everybody said it was just great but there were no people in the stands so this year the whole thing is how do we get people in the stands well luckily some guy called me up and his name was mark corbett (laughs) and i said oh god thank you god you sent me somebody that can help us (laughs) well i'll tell you what it's a pleasure and to work with you guys and to try to make something like this happen and, and make it bigger and better because to me to to give any person and I've, I've told you before sue with our you know karen our, our two young girls not them have chances to do different things and baseball baseball has been denied i mean i know several young women who've come up playing softball and never really even had the opportunity to think about baseball right. so I, I think this is a great opportunity with the tournament and I don't have the full list in front of me of all the players that you have coming, but we're talking about some superior players. This you, you use the word ragtag, but I'm thinking, uh, uh-uh. uh, this no, USA oh. team members, USA World Cup team that members, is, from the, the, the USA, USA national USA. team, and we have we have more than half of the national team coming to play, and uh, and plus the ones we had last year, which were probably just as good, but you know maybe they have full time jobs instead. People need to stand up and take notice and because and attend this tournament because you're not going to get to see these people all the time. And, you know, the, I think the great hope is, Sue, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is to build enough interest and excitement that there will be a league, a, a league of professional uh, women that's baseball that's, players. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Is I want the public to see how well these women play. And then somebody is going to come along that has uh, deep pockets and some money and says, this can be a viable business and it can be profitable. Because my whole vision is not just to have this tournament. My whole vision is to have a, a pro league right here in these stadiums. We've got the the okay the Orioles up here in Sarasota and the Pirates, and then they got the um, Braves over here in North, Northport, half hour away. Then we got the Tampa Bay Rays in Port Charlotte and the Red Sox down here in, in Fort Myers. We can have four teams. That's what our league started with: four professional teams, like the ones I've I've got listed with their new uniforms that say Rockford and South Bend and the Comets and the Bells. And and we can do it right here in the winter time, September, October, November, and December, Mark. Okay. What's going on in those stadiums? They're looking for revenue during that time. Yeah. We've got the snowbirds down here. We've got grandpas that want to have their grandkids come down for Christmas and take them to a women's pro league game. And it won't cost that much. We can keep the price down, make it reasonable instead of spending five hundred dollars to take your family to a major league baseball game. I mean, it, it all makes sense. Oh, and yeah. Everybody I've talked to has said, that's a great idea. Why don't we have women's baseball? That's the comment that comes back to me. So it's there. And there are, may I interject? And there are women out there that do play baseball. Yes. It's, it's not as if we don't have some players floating around this country. And the young ones that are play. coming up are even. They're so good, the young ones, you know. They've been playing with the little league. And that's the other thing, the the little girls that are playing and sitting on the bench with all the boys, they don't like that. When I ran a camp for girls over here at the Braves uh, Stadium, and when the girls came in and they looked out on the field and they said, oh, my God, it's all girls. They were amazed. They were thrilled. They made friends. All of a sudden, there was camaraderie. Wow. They don't have that in the dugout with the boys, and that's wrong. And the whole thing is 
not right. Well, I think a lot of people maybe will get the right idea if they're smart enough to come down here and watch some yeah, of the you games. Get them in their seat. That's <laughs> right. In their seat. Yeah. Wow. Well, ladies, I can't thank you all enough for being here today on Baseball Biz on Deck. We've been talking with Susan Pay and Lois Youngin. Uh, both of you ladies are fantastic. I appreciate you sharing the, the history of the game that you've enjoyed and looking forward to do some rejuvenation of what's happening with baseball and women for the future as well. So thank you very much and look forward to talking both, both of y'all again real soon. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much for having us. You've been listening to a very special show of baseball biz on deck with two of the players from the all American girls, professional baseball league, Sue Zappé and Lois Youngin. I hope you enjoy their stories as much as I did and take the time to visit them in Sarasota for the all American women's professional baseball tournament again that is november 17th through 19th in sarasota florida hope to see you there so thanks again for joining us here on baseball biz on deck and we look forward to talking with you guys again real soon special thanks to x take rux for the music rocking forward